I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's coming up this week on One Detroit. COVID-19 surge. We go around the globe to see how people in other countries are experiencing the pandemic. Plus the new school plan with Amber Ariano from Education Trust Midwest. Also ahead, Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson on party conventions and the presidential race. Then preventing the spread of COVID-19, learning from previous diseases. It's all coming up right now on One Detroit. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. And viewers like you. Hi there and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining me. I just want to say thanks to all of you who reached out to me after the death of my husband, Jamie Samuelson. My kids and I are taking it one day and sometimes one hour at a time. It is not easy. And the prayers and kindness that have been shown us will never be forgotten. But part of putting one foot in front of the other is getting back here. So here we go. Coming up on One Detroit, heading back to school. The plans the Michigan legislature put in place for funding and safety, but how will this impact equity and teaching? I talk with Amber Ariano from Education Trust Midwest. Plus, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of American Black Journal meet up to talk about the Democratic Convention, how COVID has changed it all, and the presidential race. Also ahead, what doctors and researchers can learn from other diseases about preventing COVID-19. But we're starting off with a look at COVID cases around the world. Numbers are spiking back up in certain countries, and we know how we're dealing in our neighborhoods and cities, but how are other people around the world living with it? Well, Bill Kubota took a tour through several time zones for the story. This Zoom technology is amazing. You find people in other countries and ask them what's going on. Our national newspaper, it's, it's uh, the press. Did you see what's going on in New Zealand? It's quoting Trump, saying New Zealand is having a big surge in COVID-19 cases. Big surge in New Zealand. So, you know, it's, uh, it's terrible. We don't want that. He talks about how bad it is, you know, kind of just like the U.S. And this reporter says, well, New Zealand only had nine new COVID cases today. The U.S. had more than 42,000. So it's not even comparable. Tecla Cridal grew up in Michigan, living in New Zealand the past few decades, that island nation over by Australia. Cridal is in the city of Christchurch. Morena, Prime Minister. Nice to have you with us. Morena. In March, uh, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern ordered a hard lockdown a country of 5 million people with 22 total COVID deaths. By June, she declared it safe to go back to normal, a shining example of how to beat the virus. Last then week, came the news um, last week. They discovered a case in the south of Auckland, our biggest city, and four family members tested positive. And what they're trying to work out is how that happened. More infections, around 30 now. Part of the country's on lockdown again, and an upcoming election has been pushed back. Was that surprising to hear what was going on in Auckland? No, no. Bill, it was always going to come back in some way, shape, or form. Whether it came in at the border, through a port worker, we just, they, just, they just don't have a handle on it yet. Sweden, about 10 million people, with a higher COVID death rate than the U.S., but lower than the U.K., Spain, Belgium. 
Dr. Jacob Winberg is a general practitioner in Gothenburg, Sweden's second biggest city. You're happily seeing patients regularly in person mm -hmm. there. Oh yeah, we have some people. We it used to be the seventy plus they were not supposed to the clinic come to the clinic. So we we you know had a lot of consultation over the phone. Now we have some on the like this telemedicine, but most people are coming to the practice and like we try to space out in the in the lobby. So seventy plus they can't come to the clinic when when it's not full. They there's no risk of being. Um, uh, contaminant in our clinic anyways. While Sweden was not locked down, some schools closed, many worked from home, but few wear masks. People living in, in uh, perhaps say poorer areas or not as well economic situated, they, they have caught more of the virus. Often because they have, you know, they are the ones who work in, in the, with the old folks home, they are taxi drivers, they work in places and they, they cannot work from home. So they have to go and, and meet their customers every day. In Japan, no official lockdown there either. And a COVID-19 death rate so much lower than the U.S. 1,000 dead compared to our 170,000. Kathy Kraut teaches at the American School in Tokyo. You know, we couldn't have a legalized lockdown. You could go anywhere. The police couldn't question you. But there was, there's kind of, you want to do what's best for society. So when I went out one time early on in the quarantine and I forgot my mask and I was walking my dog, my neighbor, who I know quite well, she looked at me in Japanese, she's like, what are you doing? Like, what are you, and I was like, I forgot, oh my gosh. And I never forgot again. So society, what's, what, what, focusing on the policies of the government doesn't actually always speak to what Japanese society, what people are actually doing. Um, and they, they, they stayed in. Do you have that app on your phone? Did you get the app? Yeah. Can you show for the, the app for the tracking? Yeah. Countries including yeah. Japan and New Zealand are encouraging their citizens to get contact tracing apps. When you go some to a business, you just scan it. So like yesterday, I was going around a little bit and it, and then I can look and I see, can see everywhere I have actually been. Kreidel says she's fine letting the government know where she's been. From Sweden, the stories we hear seem to waver in its handling of COVID-19. The idea of letting the virus spread faster to get to herd immunity. You don't have the, you know, the, the uh, key yet of what, who did the right thing. And, but I'm confident and I'm, I'm proud of what we have done. When, uh, since I think we have to live with it for some time, we, 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 I think the way we have done it is is somehow uh, sustainable over time. You have a thousand deaths in a country so big, we've got more than that many deaths in just Michigan. I know. And you're so close to China. We know. We're right here. So we so Japan pays attention. I think historically also it's been suggested that Japan has a history of epidemics where you have smallpox being documented in the 600s, 700s, 800s and on. And so the attitude of not being at war with the virus, which is the kind of the attitude you get for some people in the States is like, we're going to kill this. We're going to beat this. It's going to be eradicated where the, the attitude has been suggested here in Japan is we, we need to find a way to minimize the effects while understanding we're going we're gonna to have to live with this. The Democratic National Convention is playing out virtually this week with Joe Biden and his new running mate, Kamala Harris. COVID is changing the way campaigns are running and what people are most focused on. One Detroit contributors, Nolan Finley from the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson from American Black Journal, met up to talk a little politics. I've covered a dozen of these, and, <laughs> and I will be in Charlotte next week uh, to cover my 13th convention. But I'll tell you, I think the way this format, I, I kind of like it. I mean, this has very been very easy to digest. Now, nobody's watching. Viewership yeah. is... <laughs> I think that's... The... I don't know what the point is. I think, you know, people have so many other things to be worried about right now. So the question is... Uh, are people really tuned into politics? I feel like more people this time have already made up their minds. And I think at some point very soon, Joe Biden's going to have to be something other than not Donald Trump. 
He's got to tell him what he's about for the next four years. What's his vision? I mean, there's a very, very progressive climate plan that environmental activists are saying is the most progressive that they've ever seen come out of a Democratic candidate. Well, it was written by Ocasio-Cortez, so that's what you would expect. There's also a criminal justice plan in place, reforming criminal justice at the national level. I think they would pick up uh, very strongly on the things that the Obama administration did. They're going to have to try to sell that stuff, but conventions are not where you do that. Conventions are oh. where you get up there and you, you give this great speech uh, and, and people, yeah. people lose their minds, right? No, I'd agree with that, but I would also say that they have to be careful about playing right into the Republican pitch. And their pitch next week in Charlotte is, well, yeah, Trump may turn you off. You may not like his tone, his temperament, his personality, but the alternative is way too far left for uh, most Americans. There are a lot of people who are worried that the Joe Biden they used to know has been sort of hijacked by the party's far left. You can't unsee or unhear what you've seen and heard over the last four years. They can't make Donald Trump into something he hasn't been. Yeah. But there was a reason people four years voted for him four years ago, and a lot of that reason was he wasn't Hillary Clinton. They were afraid of Hillary yeah. Clinton. So they've got to make voters afraid of Joe Biden. Their biggest challenge, of course, is cleaning up their own candidate and cleaning up their own act. Uh, one of the things that they're going to do at the Republican convention next week is have this couple from St. Louis who saw Black Lives Matter protests going out in front of their house, uh, walking by and came outside with their guns. Uh, they, get to, they get a speaking spot uh, at the national convention, which I don't understand in, in, in any way. You don't understand because they didn't put them on the agenda to win your vote. They're not going to win your vote. You look at what's happened in gun sales in this country over the last... 90 months nine mo or three months, the last 90 days, you look what's happened to gun and ammunition sales. They are speaking to a lot of Americans who are afraid about uh, their safety. About Black Lives Matter. Yeah, that, that, that is playing to the racism that still exists both on the surface and underneath in this country. I mean, you saw them on, on camera acting the way that they did in front of a, a protest where no one else was armed and no, no one was threatening them. But here's the, here's the question. The president has leaned way more into that this time than he did four years ago. Uh, what he said about John Lewis, for instance, when he died was, a, was an example. And the question is in 2020, can you win an election doing that? Is this a country that's still susceptible uh, the way it has been uh, to that kind of rhetoric? And I think the, I think the answer is no. When people see violent spikes in murders, in crime, and they get worried about their own public safety, doesn't mean they're racist. They shouldn't have to prove that they're not racist by saying, yeah, burn our cities down, come on in here and, and, and spike up the crime rate. You, I don't think that's a winning argument. Well, what makes you a racist is when you come out of your house in, in front of a peaceful protest with a gun, uh, because they're... African Americans marching down your street. I don't think that that you can conflate, and the Republicans have been trying to do this, and unsuccessfully, conflate what people are protesting about in the streets with violence. There has been violence in the streets uh, about this summer. This is a very violent summer in yeah. a lot of American cities, including in Detroit. That actually has nothing to do with the Black Lives Matter protests. What brought violence to that? was the police. I'll be interested to see if Kamala Harris can, can deliver a law and order and a public safety message and still keep that progressive wing she was designed sort of a P to a piece when she's on, on, um, on the, when she was picked for the ticket. I think that's a, a real balancing act, act for her. There are a lot of people who don't want to vote for Trump. A lot of yeah. Republicans don't want to vote for Trump, to yeah. Trump. Certainly a lot of independents. You are not going to get them to vote for Joe Biden if he swings hard left on e almost every single issue. And if he gives the impression that he he's, doesn't favor uh, a strong police force and strong law and order, uh, you can't scare people. I think the challenge, and I'm not sure that you can do this, certainly at a convention, it would be harder even in the fall with the uh, with the campaign to define law and order in a really different way. Law and order for black people has meant uh, police doing whatever they feel they need to do and mostly uh, a 
oppressing people's uh, uh, freedoms and taking their lives. And that message is not new. That message is 40 or 50 years old. He needs those white voters, those rural voters who went for Trump, yeah. even though they weren't necessarily all that crazy for him, who can be won this time. If you have kids in the house, you are still figuring out what the beginning of the school year will look like. The Michigan legislature passed some bills a few days ago, but there is still a lot of concern about budgets, potential layoffs, school plans, and teachers. I caught up with Amber Ariano, who is the executive director of the Education Trust Midwest, for what this all looks like for Michigan. Really, what do you make of, of what came out of Lansing and what kind of impact that's going to have for our districts? This is a maybe one of the, the most historic moments for public education, really in modern recent history, certainly maybe in the last 50 years or more. Um, and I think it was really important that Governor Whitmer and the legislature um, finalize that package. Um, schools need to know sort of what the protocols are going to be for going back to school, how much flexibility they have, um, what kinds of um, data they're going to be collecting on their students. I think one of the highlights in the package was that um, the legislature made sure that they're actually going to be um, looking at how much, um, how well students are, are doing when they come in so that they can actually take a look and see um, if they've had learning loss over the la last several months and the teachers can calibrate their instruction to meet, their, meet, meet every child where they're at. What about though, when we think about what this school year is going to look like and leaving it up to each individual district to make sure that they can do what they need specifically for their community. To me, mm -hmm. it's the massive concern of the equity of what we're seeing is the gap is going to get even worse. I think the challenge right now for, for the whole country, but it's certainly in states like Michigan that are so decentralized in terms of our education system is, how do we ensure that the most vulnerable students are going to be fully supported at the levels that they need to. They need um, digital access and internet access. It's not just in urban areas, it's in working class areas. It's in middle class um, um, communities where parents may not have, um, you know, devices, enough devices in the house. And it's really in rural areas where internet access has been spotty. I mean, there's been new research that has shown that more than 40% of students in Michigan in the spring didn't actually have digital access to even go online to do their classes in the spring. So those are all huge concerns. Um, and then, then the issues around health um, in communities, communities of color in particular, where COVID rates have been the highest, particularly in the African-American community. If parents are sick or, or children are sick, hard to, hard to be um, doing quality learning at home when mom or dad is, is, um, is really ill. What are your biggest concerns when you see some of these plans that are laid out right now for the teaching ranks? We talk to a lot of teachers every week and you know we're, we're hearing teachers that are considering staying home to support their own kids they they don't feel like they can do their best for their students and their own children at the same time um, teachers that you know may not have younger ch children that are really energized about stepping up and and really leading at this moment for their students in their classroom i think one of the the biggest challenges right now for districts and staff in classrooms is that the government, the federal government has not decided on what the what this new stimulus package is going to look like. And so states, including Michigan, are, wa are waiting to hear literally on hundreds of millions of dollars and whether how much they may get and will we get it. It could mean the difference of a few layoffs in a district compared to like 20% of the teaching force. And so it is, it is urgent. It, I mean, it's, it's just really like, how do we open schools without it? What would you say, Amber, to parents in terms of that advocacy role um, going into this fall? What should parents be, I, I guess, on the lookout for? Or what should they be trying to do for, for their kids and for their district to try to get the best or do the best that they can? Um, it's important that um, state level policymakers prioritize public education, try to protect it as much as possible. It's really, it is really hard to do that. We do expect there will be budget cuts, but we're hopeful that lawmakers will understand that this is not the moment to find that those additional dollars um, in, in the public school budget. I think the, the, this question about equity that you raised in the beginning of the conversation, um, I think it's important that not just parents of color or rural or urban parents, but all Michigan parents say equity is important. 
we care about not just our kids, if we live in a middle-class district or an affluent district, but we care about all kids. It's important that immigrant kids, it's important that low-income students, it's important that students with disabilities also get a fair shot at a quality education the school year. And that means protecting them as much as possible, shielding them from the most drastic of budget cuts. Um, so I think it's a, it's a moment of, of empathy, not only for teachers, for parents, for students, but especially for families that have so many challenges in making sure that their kids have an, have an opportunity to learn at a high level. And every, every kid deserves that. As we talk about going back to school and fighting COVID-19 in terms of treatment or a vaccine, doctors are also looking at prevention and wondering if strategies from other diseases would work on COVID. Will Glover spoke with Dr. Ovita Fuller. She's a microbiologist and an associate professor at the University of Michigan. What's physically happening? An air droplet might come out of your mouth, it gets caught in the wind, and then what? Take us through the steps to you know actually becoming you know, infected with the virus? So COVID is produced in the respiratory tract along the nasal passages of uh, the respiratory tract and nose and throat. And as it reproduces, obviously that tissue has the ability to try to get rid of things. So when we sneeze or cough, we're trying to get rid of the, whatever the irritation is, even dust. So what's happening then, if I'm producing virus, um, I don't know it. Um, and you are talking to me, and if you're close enough that the aerosols or the respiratory droplets that go out reach you when you inhale, then that goes into your nasal passages and the, those um, droplets or aerosols that have the virus then attach to your nasal passages and begin the replication process for you. And so that's why the social distancing, meaning staying away from people, because if you don't breathe in my aerosols or my respiratory droplets, you won't get it. In getting people to understand that, you've used something called the trusted messenger. So could you just explain a little bit to me about what the trusted messenger intervention is? Trusted messenger then was born from an invitation by actually a bishop in uh, Zambia to come and train his clergy about HIV. This is because they were losing so many people they were having several funerals a day in the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic due to deaths from HIV. And there were many myths circulating. Um, is it uh, a curse? Is it um, uh, uh, something that was made to destroy uh, African countries? And the truth is, it's just a little virus that uh, needs humans to replicate in. And actually, HIV wasn't even the most strong virus. COVID is a lot stronger because it's, it's a respiratory virus in, in many senses. I realize that if people, if we understand some of these things, but people don't know to use them, then we haven't completed the full circle. When it comes to COVID, where have the shortfalls in the messaging and the communication and pushing of an understanding of what the science is and what the proper steps of prevention should be? Where, where have you seen the, the ball dropped on that? One, the messaging has not been there. The availability of testing has not been there. And thirdly, the leadership, both national and in some cases local, has not been there. What I mean by that is this is something that we, I cannot fix, you cannot fix alone. It takes community effort to do this. And those things are not being done. There is rare leadership. Michigan has been very fortunate in that we've had amazing um, leadership, statewide leadership, to do the things very cautiously to help prevent uh, widespread um, infection. And even so, when things open up, we see what happens, the numbers go back up. Even thinking about sending children back to schools, uh, which is another whole topic. I, I said early on to a group that if I had school-aged kids, I would homeschool them if I possibly could or work with other parents to make sure that we provided an isolated situation for our children because we just don't know enough about how this virus works and we cannot manage the conditions in schools well enough to be able to, for me to say safely, it's a safe environment for children or staff or teachers. So th these, are, these, are, these are difficult um, questions, but if we stick to the basics of what we do know, 
we would be much further along than we are with the ups and downs from trying to reopen too soon or trying to do what we think is normal or what we want to do. This is partially about the human will to care about other people more than we care about what we want to do ourselves. And, you know, maybe that's the lesson to come out of this COVID pandemic. And that'll do it for One Detroit. Thanks so much for being here with me. Again, you can always find us at OneDetroitPBS.org, plus on social media at One Detroit. And remember, One Detroit Arts and Culture is on Monday nights at 7.30, so you can double your One Detroit fix in one week. I'll see you next time. Enjoy the sunshine and take care. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. And viewers like you.